Yep, okay. Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Lens Lounge. And this evening, we've got um, someone that I know through um, Kim Grant's uh, Photograph Connections and want to bring in Daryl Oakton. So good evening, Daryl. How are I'm you? Fine, thank you very much. And thank you for asking me to um, join this conversation tonight. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. It's our pleasure. So um, so if we just start off, you might just give everyone that's listening a wee bit of background behind yourself, Daryl, and what, what you're Absolutely. all about, Absolutely. Well, um, Probably the way that anybody would know me at the moment is that I run a YouTube channel um, that's based in photography. Um, I got to know Brian, as he's mentioned, through Kim Grant. And I reached out to Kim Grant probably about six months ago to ask her onto the channel um, to do an interview. And from that, I, I got um, to meet uh, Brian through Photographic Connections and there's a community built up based on that. Um, but my YouTube channel um, is mainly um, landscape and wildlife based. And I've been doing it now for about four years. Um, I started in 2019. I had a bit of a false start. And then I went to it um, with a vengeance at the beginning of 2020. And then lockdown happened. And that really gave me loads of time to really focus on it. Okay, thanks for that. That's great. Okay, that's fine. I had a look at your I had a look at your uh Instagram portfolio, um, Daryl, and um I was um quite intrigued with the with the um the type of photos that you you've been taking. So landscape and wildlife, because usually people would maybe combine landscape with seascape and and urban, you know, urban scape or cityscape. But it's it's quite unusual to have that uh, wildlife and landscape put together. So yeah. is there a reason behind it? Is it a planned one or is it an accidental mix of um you know photography um subjects? No, not at all. Um, but I suppose, really, I need to give you a little bit of background um, because originally, if I go way, way back to when I first got a camera, probably back in 2000, it was a very early 2000s anyway, mm -hmm. I, I was very into taking landscapes and it was just landscapes. And the reason that I got into photography was the advent of digital when you could look mm. at the back of the camera and delete things rather than taking your film to boots and all that kind of thing. I was never into dark room or any, any of those kind of types of photography. And so it stem, if, if I go back even further to when I was at high school, I always considered myself to be very creative and I did a level art, but I could never quite find the time to develop my painting mm. skills i still do a little bit now but i i'd got that creative part of me that needed an outlet <laughs> and i found that photography was a lot more instant um mm. and so at first it was at heart i'm a quite shy person um mm -hmm. which seems strange having a youtube channel and being a teacher because that's my profession so i, I talk for a living as such um, but really, I'm quite a shy person. And so I need some way of expressing myself in a way <laughs> that I, I, I haven't got through um, just my natural exuberance. Now, over mm -hmm. time, I think I've developed that and I've got a lot better, certainly mm -hmm. at uh, performing and being sociable. I know my wife always says I'm the person that sits in the corner and She's the one that does all the talking, which it works quite well for us. But um, so that creative outlet is what really drew me to um, photography. Mm -hmm. And then in probably the early 2010s, I mm -hmm. decided I needed some more of an outlet to share my images. And I joined a camera mm -hmm. club and joining that camera club completely radically changed the way that I viewed photography because I thought mm -hmm. that I was quite good. I used to keep all of my 
images in little folders and I'd rank them to which ones I thought were the best. Mm. And um, so I'd have my top quality ones that I thought, and I've looked at them since, and they're, they're quite embarrassing, really. Uh, and joining the camera club, um did that i needed to develop um how to mm -hmm. um compose better and what made strong engaging images uh, and so it taught me a lot and i got in i got introduced to using um photoshop a lot and mm -hmm. manipulating images and creating composites and for a long time i did solely composite images and moved away from the landscape um, mm -hmm. to um, do those composite images. And that's um, what I tended to do very well with in competitions. Mm -hmm. Then I got a bit disillusioned with that. Um, and I went away to Iceland. Mm -hmm. And that reignited my love of landscape photography. And I wanted to mm -hmm. get better at it. But equally, at the same time, I'd been developing my wildlife um, through we, we live out in the countryside and I've got mm -hmm. a shed in the back garden that um, is set up as a bird hide. So I, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd done quite a lot of bird photography. And so the two just seem to mesh together. I get mm -hmm. equally as much pleasure from wildlife as I do from landscape photography and. Um, for completely different reasons. Um, landscape is something that doesn't move. And so you're mm -hmm. in control. Um, you have to be there at the right time, obviously, to get the right light. But it, it's a slower process and a bit more relaxing. Whereas wildlife is hit and miss. You still have to be mm -hmm. in the right place at the right time. But you've got that excitement when you get that shot and uh, or mm -hmm. the the bird or the, the the other type of wildlife shows up and I get a thrill from that that I don't get the same from um the landscape, landscape. but I do get the creative um aspect from the landscape so that's why the two um are mixed so that was a very long answer for a very short question <laughs> no, that that's actually really great, and I I can relate to to what you said about you know um, taking photos and and thinking God this is so great and then being proud of it, and that I experienced that myself when I look at my photos that when I started with my photography hobby, it make me cringe basically. <laughs> I said, oh my God, what 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 was I thinking and and it does um yeah it resonates your answer um I don't know whether Brian and Gladys is a follow-up question uh, I will have I'll have a follow-up question actually if um you know but I'll okay. give them okay well just just something actually Daryl you just mentioned you were in a camera club and um did you ever enter competitions or what was your thoughts on those yeah I, I well at first um I, when I joined the camera club, the, the competitions were um, quite important and probably still are. Um, anybody that's part of a camera club probably gets pushed towards entering competitions. And to be fair, initially, I found the competition scene really invigorating and I did learn an awful lot from it. Um, getting a, a judge coming along critiquing your images is really useful because some of them are very blunt, some of them are very good, but equally some of them are not so good. And so mm -hmm. you have to you have to learn a bit of a thick skin when it comes to competitions. But on the whole, I would say that I um, did learn an awful lot from it. And over time, mm -hmm. I, I I was quite successful as well. Um, possibly one of my biggest successes um and I, I knew this question was coming up so, uh, I've got it here i've got a no it's not yeah, uh, it's, can, there's yeah. a i won't focus come on focus on there it is there we, so, go, there we go there we are 
So this mm -hmm. is a gold medal from Dingwall that's in Scotland. Um, and mm. this was for the, the best image in the in the competition. So it was a national competition. And I I I won that one and I've got several other gold medals on a shelf downstairs. And I've entered competitions all over the world. I've got accreditations, I've got an EFI app, I've got mm -hmm. um a BP five um and other uh, another accreditation as well um and I, I it got to a point where i was only going out to take a photo i thought would do well in a competition um mm. and i i'm not a very good loser um mm. i um i like to do well at what i do and so I was putting an awful lot of pressure on myself to carry on doing well. Once you've, yeah. once you've done well in the club, then there's the, the ex, well, I don't know whether there's an expectation, but I was putting expectations on myself to do well again the following year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, it got to the point where I really, really despised going out with a camera because mm -hmm. it was, mm -hmm. it was, there was always that thing. If I didn't come back with an image that I could use as a competition image, I mm. felt like it had been a wasted outing. Um, mm -hmm. And once I came to that realization, I thought, this is, this is wrong. I'm not taking photos for the right reason. I'm just mm. taking them with the thought that a judge might like them or I might do well in a competition or get a certain mm -hmm. amount of points or an award or something like that. And I just decided that was it. I'd had enough of competitions and I, and I stopped mm -hmm. doing them much to the dismay of the people at the camera club, because even, even last week, mm -hmm. um, I, I still, I'm still part of the camera club. And mm -hmm. last week I did a, a photo tips talk to the the members and showed some of my photos and a few of them were saying oh we do wish you'd, we'd got your images to enter into competitions against other clubs mm. um but the thought of it just doesn't appeal to me anymore because i i feel now that i've learnt a lot and mm -hmm. i'm i'm also a judge myself i do still whenever i can do some some judging and so I'm, I'm quite critical of other judges as well. And, and the judges that are of a poorer quality um, let the, the better judges down almost. And, and you get some very negative or disparaging comments. Now, I can take them on the chin, but I just find them unnecessary sometimes. And yeah. so I, I gave all of that up just because I, I'd, I'd had enough of the the rat race almost of trying to mm. do well all the time. Mm. But did you find it actually um, stopped your own creativity in some ways because the fact that you were too busy thinking about how a picture has to look for a competition than actually trying to experiment and find out different things or photo, you know? But yeah. But part of photography yes. is experimenting as well. It's not just about entering perfect photo. Mm. Um, and entering a competition, there is a certain style of photograph that will do well. And I, I do feel that I was being creative. Um, mm -hmm. But I was doing photography for competitions. And so I was being creative in a different way. A lot of my um, composite images are, are possibly some of my most creative work. Um, mm. And I, I wanted to put, make, craft an image because it is about crafting an image. You have to get different mm. elements, put them together, and then learn the Photoshop skills to make them look realistic. And so they were certainly creative but it was equally very narrowing mm -hmm. because um, taking photographs for a competition is single genre in a mass form. Yeah. Um, 
there are things that I photograph now that I know I definitely wouldn't put into a competition, but I get possibly more pleasure from taking them. Mm -hmm. um, they are not competition images. They wouldn't do well in a competition. Um, but I take photographs now for the enjoyment of um, the photography process and mm -hmm. And I'm I'm now creative in a much different way, and and I mm -hmm. get much more pleasure from it because I don't feel now that I'm being judged. Yes, I do put my images onto my YouTube channel, and they're there mm -hmm. for people to see, but I'm not asking people to like them or dislike them. Um, yeah. They, it's if people like them, it's a bonus now to me. That um, mm -hmm. they're, they're not, I'm not taking images for judges approval yeah another thing um i, want... I... another thing i want to ask I'm, I'm glad yeah it's about your composition images you were talking about compositions what kind of compositions do you do because i know for example some photographers they take images of different types and then style it into a particular genre for storytelling or art digital artwork mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering what do you define as composition a lot of a lot of the images that I you made compositions from were based on a person, so it was trying to tell a story. So I would do a a person photo shoot. Um, I would do things like go to a steampunk event and get some mm -hmm. interesting characters, and then I would think where would I be able to use that character? Think of a story that I could insert that character into. Um, to make it almost feel cinematic in a way, so mm -hmm. it was that was that was the idea that I was going for to try and really tell a story, but with a person as the main character. Um, and so the more interesting I, character that I could find, which is why recreations um, like. Um, I've been to battle recreations to get uh, people that were um, dressed in military uniforms uh, or Victorian days, um, anything that um, gave a character uh, in a slightly different uh, costume um, that could then be put into a different background and give some different elements to the story and make a really visually impactful mm -hmm. image interesting yeah. yeah i just have a follow-up question uh daryl um mm -hmm. you mentioned in your in your instagram and um you also mentioned that uh, you know with your youtube channel um the the blurb in your instagram basically says that you want people to learn or you want uh, to teach people um how you know how to do photography so is that the the reason why you have um a youtube channel to to um actually you know try and teach or impart some some techniques uh to that or is it a, a different you know a different um the youtube channel does it follow with the teaching um one thing to teach or is it uh, as a different one or are you planning to to do some workshops or anything in the future yeah um there's there's several layers to this because initially um it was not to teach um mm -hmm. the initial reason behind starting the youtube channel was literally because i'd got to that point where i was disillusioned with the competitions but i hadn't then got an outlet i was kind mm. of, I, I was floundering for about six months without a, i was looking for a genre to focus mm -hmm. on something that would inspire me again um and then i visited iceland as i mentioned mm -hmm. and that reignited my passion and so i'd watched several youtubers such as kim grant and nigel dance and thomas eaton the the big names and i thought well I'm sure I could have a go at that, not to be famous, not to have millions mm -hmm. of subscribers, but mm -hmm. it was literally just a kick up the behind to get out with my camera. But I knew in the process, 
I could chart my um, developing skills in landscape photography. Uh, my very, mm. very first video, I was sat downstairs and I, I, I did a just a talking head to the camera just to say um, this this channel is going to be about me trying to become a better landscape photographer. And that mm. was the reason initially. I was just going to chart my pitfalls and successes. But then I realized as time went on mm. that because I'm a teacher by profession, that need to teach um, just comes mm. out and I can't help myself. When I when I go to the camera club, I, I want to teach mm. people. People will come and ask me questions. Uh, I want to impart my knowledge that mm. I've built up over, over time. It's just part of who I am. And mm. so I do do a, quite a lot of that on the YouTube channel. I do some how to how to focus, how to do exposure on that, as well as just straightforward vlogs as well. Mm. Um, now, down the line, I, I do want to um, maybe explore workshops. Mm -hmm. Um, I have um, been approached by the RSPB um, mm -hmm. and they want me to do a photography workshop sometime in the spring and also one of the local um, wildlife parks have also asked me to do a photo workshop and so mm -hmm. they're sort of semi-organized and there's not they're not me initiating it as such mm -hmm. um, it's not something that I've got in the pipeline mm -hmm. but down the line it could well be it's just really knowing where to go how to do it mm. and how, just how to organize it but it's certainly something that i would be interested in okay ready okay right okay well darrell i know on your website you just you know you just like saying that it's all about enjoying yourself and your photography so what what makes you happy when you're out doing photography well, I I like the creative process. As I mentioned earlier, I, I, I think I'm a very creative person. Um, and, and just that being out in nature and creating an image that tells a story of where you are or even something that just means something to myself. Um, now I've got rid of the shackles of competition Theorem, uh, and I'm taking photographs for me. Mm -hmm. I I can just do things that I enjoy, uh, and I can. I made one video where I just went into the back garden with my macro lens and just took things on my knees of drops of water and all kinds of interesting things that you wouldn't have seen before, and. Two hours went by in no time at all. Mm -hmm. And I just really enjoyed that slightly different um, way of taking photographs. I've done things where I've taken photographs of kitchen utensils in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. um, and these are kind of things that you wouldn't be able to do if you were tied to a specific genre. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I like that outlet that you get from photography when you can just do mm -hmm. something that's a little bit different and it it took a while to develop that um it's a catchphrase now almost on my um on my youtube channel and i think i must have been going for about six months before it occurred to me that i was really enjoying the process of taking photographs mm -hmm. again and I, I do actually remember where I was when I first used um, that catchphrase. Um, you might know it yourself if you know the roaches, um, Janet. Mm -hmm. um, yes. There's a place called Three Shires Head that's just mm -hmm. behind the roaches. And it's a, it's a really lovely place. It's where the, the counties of Staffordshire, Derbyshire and Cheshire meet. Mm -hmm. they, they, they all meet at a point. And mm -hmm. just at that point, there's a bridge that goes over a set of waterfalls and it's a really picturesque location. Um, and 
I was there and I thought, yeah, this is just amazing. I am really enjoying photography again, mm -hmm. just being mm -hmm. out here, taking these photographs, being creative, going out for a sunrise, going for a sunset, um, mm. even taking the pictures of the kitchen utensils. Uh, it just, mm. I just found the whole process just really inspiring. Um, mm -hmm. And I've even got to the point now where I enjoy the editing and the filming process nearly as much as the taking the photos as well, because mm -hmm. it's another form of creativity. It's another mm -hmm. outlet. Mm -hmm. And it was a whole new set of skills that I had to learn um, to produce the videos, because mm -hmm. at, at heart, I'm also quite a tech head as well. I Part of the reason that I like photography is the gear. I think a lot mm -hmm. of people might say the same thing. Uh, I like the the latest gear and the knobs and the buttons and all of that kind of thing. I've got so much equipment in the cupboard at the top of the stairs that uh, mm. I've built up over time. And then the videoing process introduced a whole load of new skills that I needed to think about. And constructing a video mm -hmm. uh, and editing it and thinking about taking atmospheric shots to add into it and the whole putting the camera down and walking away and walking back again, the YouTuber's nightmare of um, <laughs> doubling the amount of space that you walk. Um, and then even down to finding the right soundtrack for the mm. video, it's more creativity mm. that just helps to tell a story. And I, I must say that even after four years of, of doing it, I still mm. look forward now to going out to take my next video and take my next photographs. It still doesn't feel a chore. Um, and it was when I was doing that for competitions. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I just love my whatever's going to be my next shoot or my next challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I just find mm -hmm. it so really enjoyable. And the fact that now I'm also getting feedback um mm -hmm. from viewers as well um mm -hmm. is really encouraging there was a guy that um messaged me um who lived in new york and, and so when you start getting messages from all over the world mm -hmm. you think wow I'm, I'm i'm making a difference here people are mm -hmm. watching what i'm doing and this guy said that um he'd watch my videos and he'd been suffering from some mental issues and mm -hmm. it gave him the um, inspiration to get out with his camera and was really helping him. And I just right. found that just mm -hmm. so rewarding mm -hmm. to be able to touch somebody else's life, just doing what I enjoy doing. And so that is now what inspires me. I'm mm -hmm. not I'm not after subscribers um, because I'm never going to be a Nigel Danson or a Tom Vassie. Mm -hmm. That's never going to happen. But um, I I have got a dedicated fan base. I get a lot of comments and a lot of regular commenters who mm -hmm. um, watch my videos and look forward to them coming out. And mm -hmm. you, you do want to um, provide something for those mm -hmm. people that have supported you because yeah. some of the people have commented now for nearly the whole time that I've had the channel and, and have mm -hmm. stuck with me. And that's mm -hmm. really, really um, heartening. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same as me. I mean, I've not got a YouTube channel like that, but I've got my Facebook page that's great and I get the same. It's the engagement, isn't it? And it's people, mm -hmm. you're, giving, you're telling a story and they're loving it. And some people, like, you know, that they, they can resonate with you or, like you say, if the mental health or even if it's mm -hmm. expats, you're in an area, you know, that's how I find it. But it's, uh, it's really, yeah, I love it. But um I do like your videos, they're really good, and especially the one when you were, you know, rebuilding your, the bit where all the birds, their feeders were, that was really quite good, and storing all the wood to make it very organic, yeah. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> well, that, that, was, that was the main reason, really, why I um, started taking on the wildlife um, part of the videos, because I've, I've been taking photographs of birds in my back garden for years, and originally it was 
to try and do well in competitions. Mm. But, but I needed a different. I needed a few different styles, and I started off with literally. Um, I put my two man tent on the lawn to use as a hide. Sat in the tent and took photographs from there. And then it progressed to a little pop up hide, and then. Mm. After a period of time, I started thinking, well, I could build a shed and stick some mm. holes in it and make it more permanent. Uh, and and so now that, well, the shed must be getting on for 10 years old and I'm ready for a mm. new one. But um, I can go and sit for two, three hours just in mm -hmm. the shed and just lose time. And yes, it's mainly the same old birds um, that come along. But then the other day, I um, Brian was saying that he saw one of my videos um, where we got a sparrow hawk just swooped mm. down and landed on one of the perches. And I managed to get a shot of that before it took off. And, mm. and you, you, you never quite know what you're going to see. We get mm -hmm. um, great spotted woodpeckers. Um, mm. I've had um, pheasants just wandering through the back garden. I even had a, uh, a mandarin duck at one point when we've got no <laughs> ponds really that near to us. It was that mm -hmm. really bizarre. And um, following from that, for you was talking about your YouTube, YouTube channel, is what's the most um, biggest compliment you ever got from any of the people that watch your videos? I think I probably already mentioned it. The fact that uh, I've helped somebody get back into um photography who was suffering from the the mental illness i think that that one stands out in my mind but i over the time I've, i don't think i've ever had any negativity a few times i tend to misidentify birds um and somebody will say oh you got that one wrong and oh, okay fair enough but i don't get any negativity people don't say oh i hate your videos they're rubbish 99.9% .9 of what the, the comments that I get are really kind and really positive. Uh, the people say they enjoy the videos. They like the style. Um, they, I, I try and make it fairly lighthearted, but also entertaining. I don't, I don't do long videos. I keep them a, at about 10 minutes. So they're fairly punchy. Um, and do it in a in a style that is hopefully quite accessible as well. I don't I don't have a big opinion of myself. Um, it's mm. just hopefully people will like the images. They'll like my style, um, and I do want to try and put over that I'm enjoying myself as well. And people do get that. A, a lot of the comments that um, I get from people say that they can really feel the energy and how much that I'm enjoying my, the process of um, taking the photographs. And that that's probably the biggest compliment. I don't think there's any one particular, but the general comments that I get when people say that, yeah, we, we can see that you're enjoying what you're doing. And it just helps validate that you know, what you're doing, that you're just enjoying it because when people do that, it just helps build that up. You know, you just... You know, and it's just good that you know that people are just maybe waiting to see what you're going to put out in your next video and things like that. You know, that's what kind of happens. And also, yeah. following yeah. from your YouTube channel and generally the stories that you video, the photos you video, what is the funniest moment that has ever happened while you've been videoing your photographs? Oh. Or um... oh, I've I've had um, quite a number of funny moments. Um, I'm fairly clumsy, as my wife quite often will remind me uh, on many occasions. There's the one I've already mentioned where I dropped the camera in the, the river um, as part of a... I don't think we were filming at the time, actually, when I mentioned that. Um, but I was on a photo shoot and um, I'd set the camera up um, to film myself, walked away from it and watched the camera fall in slow motion oh into um, the river and that managed to kill that. Um, I've got um, video as well of me. I, I went down to fairly locally to where I live and I was again by a river and I sat on the edge of a fence that collapsed and I went backwards over. Um, I, now, luckily, I managed to hold onto the fence and I must have flipped, done an almost 360 and landed on my feet in the river 
And I have got it on video as well because I was filming at the time. But uh, what I do is all of those kind of images, all of those clips and videos I put together into a blooper reel. Um, and so there'll be another one coming out on April the 1st. So I don't know when this video will be released. Either it'll be very shortly that that will be released or it will have been very recently. Um, but I've got my latest blooper special coming out on um, April the 1st. Um, and this will be number 10. So I don't take myself too seriously as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Over time, I, I've definitely got better. But some days you go out and it's so difficult to string a sentence together almost because uh, I just make loads of mistakes um, and so I save them all and put them together into a blooper <laughs> reel and again I think that's part of not taking myself too seriously yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I'm not doing it to be the next big thing I'm just doing it for the enjoyment and again I get people saying that the it, they don't get many views but people do say that they enjoy those bloopers because it's just it's just a way of poking fun at myself and, and just saying I'm, I'm not taking it too mm -hmm. seriously mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. No, it's, I, I like these bloopers. They're, they're funny. Eh? <laughs> just, you know, I remember seeing one before. It's really good, Darrell. So keep it up. <laughs> oh, there's no okay. no shortage. Um, I I actually finalised. Well, it'll be it'll be coming out on Monday, won't it? We're we're now on <laughs> we're now on Tuesday, so it'll be coming out on Monday. I tend to release one on April the 1st and maybe one at Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've almost got enough for number 11 as well um <laughs> so I, I i could probably release another one almost straight away but i'll save it till possibly yeah, wait, Christmas. <laughs> excellent okay well, i think we should maybe start looking at some of your images now so yeah. um, i think we'll just absolutely lovely what hold on i'll just move this out of the way second yeah what what i loved about this well well clearly i love my trees as you know daryl um yeah but what I loved about this was you've got the you've got the, the cold, frosty uh, and blue sky on, on the one side, and then you've got the, the warmth with the with the greens and the and the yellows on the other side and whatever and like that leading line all you know, literally, you know, and and, and the light's fantastic and well, first of all, you know, where is this? Because it looks absolutely wonderful. And don't, hopefully it's not one of your composite images, but I don't think it is. No, it's not. <laughs> um, no. But it's absolutely beautiful. I love it. So if you can just talk a wee bit about it, please. I think it's Of course, amazing. yeah. Um, well, this is probably very well known to people who live in in the area that I live in. It's... Uh, in between Staffordshire and Derbyshire. And it's um, where I'm sat to take this photograph is a hill called Chrome Hill. And the pointed one in front is called Parkhouse Hill. And it's kind of um, the probably probably the closest village is a place called Longner. And it, it's just on the Staffordshire Derbyshire border. Um, it's only about 20 minutes from Leek, um, which is where I work. And it's uh, quite difficult to get to because there, there isn't a car park, uh, anywhere to park the car really close. So it's about half an hour's walk from the nearest place that you can park the car. And so for this particular shot, I arrived at the little village of Earl Sterndale, which is somewhere nestled behind the tree. And I mm -hmm. walked to this location in the dark. Um, and so there's a road to the right of the pointy hill that you walk down. And then you've got to climb up the hill across the ridge that you can see on the right hand side. And then the hill where I am taking the photograph from is about... 45 degrees angle it's quite steep mm. but i wanted to be there for the sunrise and so this is obviously just slightly before the sunrise um and i've got shots that came after this where the sun came up that i think are equally as strong um that have got the sun in the image 
and you've got the sun rays. But at the time, I decided to go a little bit further up the hill and the top of the tree then had gone below the horizon. And I think it's stronger with the top of the tree breaking the horizon rather than having it below the horizon. Yeah. Um, and so that that's why I've gone for this one, even though it's not got the sun in the image. You've still got the glow in the sky. But as you say, yes, it's not uh, it's not a composite. It's it's <laughs> it's had a little bit of dodging and burning just to bring out the the highlights in the um the hill in the foreground and some of the other um bits of interest but yeah it's it's an amazing place but um if you look down at the ground you can see plenty of tripod holes it's one of those kind of places oh is it yeah. Yeah. But even if, even if, even if the mist and the are we off just under where the sun is in the distance yeah. you know it's what what I really want, and I've seen photographs of it, is um, inversions in the valley. Oh yeah. So you, mm. so you get all the valley floor covered in mist, and then the the pointy hill and the tree poking out of the the inversion, and that would be the ideal um, image. But uh, I don't. I've never actually managed to photograph an inversion. Mm. I don't think I've got quite the talent at reading the. Um, meteorological apps to um <laughs> forecast it um i'm gonna have to get better at that mm -hmm. that's my next goal i think to um manage to get an inversion but it come, is an amazing up, location come up to the trossacks <laughs> 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 it pretty much happen all the time in the right time of the year okay look um Okay, so there, I'm very fortunate that I've got a neighbour who owns a pond and um, he um, said to me possibly now about five or six years ago, Mm -hmm. um i've got some owls in my owl box do you want you're you're a photographer aren't you would you like to come and take some photos and i went down and took some photographs of these owls in the owl box and, and he said i'll get a kingfisher down here as well i said you don't do you so <laughs> we uh, get it quite often i said amazing <laughs> he's like he said yeah yeah come down anytime you want and and it's literally five minutes walk away from my house Mm. Um, um, where this pond is and I said well I'll struggle to photograph a kingfisher without some kind of hide he said oh crack on and build one I don't mind mm. uh, and I said okay uh, I'll have to think of what I'm going to build it out of and he said well I've got these corrugated iron arches that we used to keep pigs in you can have one of those if you like mm. and, and he was just so accommodating <laughs> he, he, he didn't he didn't uh mind whatever i did at all and i can pretty much go whenever i want um and just sit in the hide and so over time i've developed this hide and if you've if anybody that's watched my channel will have seen the hide loads of times i've got a video where i built it i've got a mm -hmm. video where i refurbished it and put it onto stilts because in the winter the pond does um get quite flooded and the water mm -hmm. level comes up quite a lot. So I needed to build it up out of the water. Mm -hmm. But I end up getting these kingfishers around about four metres away from the hide. Mm. Um, so that this photograph here was on one of the perches that I put in that was almost so close you could re out, reach out and touch it. Mm. It's And that's how you manage to get the the super detail because mm -hmm. it's so close but no matter how many times i see the kingfisher even if it's only from a distance mm -hmm. it's just such a magical bird when, when you see it uh, and you see that flash of blue or hear the call mm -hmm. um you just i get such a thrill it's like mm -hmm. it's so exciting and especially when it lands on those perches right in front of the hide um i've i've got i've got them sat on the perch 
um, regurgitating pellets, eating fish. Um, I've, I did try at one point to get them diving into the water, but uh, it wasn't really very successful. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got lots, lots and lots and lots of photographs like this. Downstairs in the living room, I've got, mm. it's not this particular one, but I've got a four foot canvas on the wall in the living room of a kingfisher on a branch that I took. Um, and and what I do is I, I I printed the same canvas off and gave it to the the, the my friend who lives at the pond. And I've done a, several mm. other prints of the kingfishers and he got them all around his house. I think mm. if, if he's kind enough to let me use his pond, I repay him with loads yeah. of photos of kingfishers. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. Yeah, it's a it's a really great photograph, and um, and you're right about uh, you know there's just something quite magical about uh, kingfishers, and um and you know every time people see even a photo or you know see it in person, it's just like something that is rare because it's you know un unless like what you said, you are near a pond where they're known to frequent, they're quite difficult to actually um, see or or even identify because they're so fast. Yeah, you'll, you'll quite often see them flash past. I've been mm -hmm. out at reserves before where you've seen them fly across the water and you don't stand a chance of photographing them. Um, yeah. But there is a, I'm trying to remember what his name is. Um, Mike Lane, I think he's called. Um, he's another YouTuber, um, but he, he's very good at photographing kingfish, and he's got quite a lot of really good videos that I used quite a few times in getting some tips for how to photograph these. But what he does is he'll go to a river where he knows that they are, and he'll every time he goes, he'll put a different perch into the river, find a branch and put it into the river, because apparently um, the kingfishers will look for different perches because that might be an opportunity to then provide a fishing spot. That was a good mm. tip. But I, mm -hmm. I tend not to change mine as regularly because I'm stuck to being in front of the hide. But around the outside of the pond, I've got no end of extra branches that I've stuck into the into the mm. pond. Mm -hmm. and, um, I just wanted to know what was the story behind this. Well, in our back garden well i call it a back garden but we're 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 basically an old farmhouse and so around us we've got a couple of acres of land and we've got a back paddock that's got an apple tree in it and in the winter when the apples have fallen onto the ground we get quite a few field fare so this is a field fare which is related to the thrush um but they're nowhere near as common as the thrush um but they are attracted during the winter to fallen apples and those kind of things to um, feed on. And so this is in my back garden as such. And I've got a pop-up hide. So it's a there's two seats. You sit in the seats and then throw the top over you and straight away you're you're in the hide. So I'd set it up in in a position where I knew the field fairs were. And I went out on this particular morning where it was frosty which I think really adds to the atmosphere of the image. Um, and I chose this one really because of the pose of the bird, which I think is slightly different and a, and a bit unusual, but also the fact that you've got the two apples or the half-eaten apples in the front of the image as well that just help tell the story. That's the whole, per whole reason why the field fair visited in the first place. Um, and so it just all tied together and we got the sun just starting to emerge. Um, it was quite low, so the light's quite warm as well. And I, th so I just think the whole image works really well. Attitude of the bird, the frost on the ground, the lighting, mm. and then just the addition of the couple of apples at the front. And how far away are you to get you know, a focal length? Do you roughly know approximately? I was about, that was about 10 metres away, I think. Okay. 
And so I would have been at uh, probably 400 mil, thinking mm -hmm. about which lens I would have used for this. I think I would have probably got me 100 to 400. And so it would probably be at 400 mil. Um, and maybe cropped in a little bit as well. Not massive amounts, but um, just crop it in just to square the frame and just remove anything that's unnecessary. Yeah, fill the frame but, with the uh, It's a kind of a misnomer, really, that you need a very, very wide open aperture to get that kind of depth of field. Um, something like a 7.1 at that kind of um, at 400 mil will still yeah. give you um, that kind of um, depth of field. Yeah. You've even managed to get the upstanding leaf nicely focused as well with the frost on the edges of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which which is what you which is what you get from having a slightly smaller aperture. If you if a, I think my hundred to four hundred will go down to about five six at uh, at full full extension, mm -hmm. but that can sometimes not quite give you enough depth of field. So I might not have got that leaf and focus or mm -hmm. all of the bird. You can you can really struggle if you if you go too wide open. So having a little bit narrow aper uh, narrower aperture can just help, mm -hmm. yeah, st and still get the background out of focus. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, that uh, that separation. Oh, it's lovely though. It's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, very yeah. A very proud chest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's I think the thrush the the thrush part of it that uh, is very thrush like markings, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, on the video that I filmed for this, I've got more details and my memory is not very good. I can remember it's a field fair and I think they come over from, I, I want to say Scandinavia, but I may well be wrong. Uh, I think they, they come over for the winter um, and then go back to wherever they came from. Okay. But uh, if, if I mention facts like that, I've, I inevitably get them wrong. <laughs> I, uh, do do you find that you get the same birds coming back? You know, migrating back. I I don't know whether they are the same individuals. I couldn't say for certain um, whether they are the exact same birds, mm. but we do. We've got outbuildings as well. With it being an old farm, we've got some um, stables, and very soon now we'll get the swallows coming back, and they always amaze me how they go away to. Um, warmer climbs and then hmm. end up coming back to know that there's space in our barns for for places to roost it's just it's amazing. amazing yeah it is, yeah we have a video to me them actually nesting and any of them giving but you know hatches and... i I've, I've i've got i've got photographs of of them on the electricity wires because every every year around may time I do a little project for the YouTube channel to see how many birds I can photograph in three days. Okay. And so far, every year, I've managed to beat my total. And so this year is going to be heat even harder. And so by that time, the swallows are about. But I've not actually done any video videoing of them nesting. So that could be a possible um, possibility for this year. Yeah, because I think because you've got all the highs and everything, you probably can capture a lot more about yeah. how you know how they live and the whole life cycle of them. You know, giving yeah. birth to chicks and yeah. and then obviously the next generation yeah. of birds that come in. Yeah, we did. We did have one family decimated by magpies last year. So yeah. my father-in-law built a scarecrow that sits outside the door. So there's a which is quite disconcerting if you walk out in the morning and suddenly see this <laughs> life-size um, scarecrow stood outside the barn. It's like, ooh, what's that? <laughs> I, mean, I notice the magpies fight quite a lot with a lot of the other birds, don't they? Because, like, well, where I live, we've got, I've got, like, huge trees and it's full of, like, different types of birds, but I notice the magpies tend to have warfare with the other birds. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so this this composite is probably one of the last ones that I did, and it is the one that I was most successful with. I mentioned earlier that I got the gold medal in the Dingwall um, competition, yeah. and this was the image that got 
that award, it was placed first in the entire uh, exhibition, not just the section that it was in, the entire exhibition. And that's the only time that's ever happened with any of my images. I've had gold medals in sections before, but never won the whole competition. And so there is a, a CD just here mm -hmm. that I got from the, um, from the competition with my image on the front of it. Um, and that was another wow moment. And this was, it was bizarre really. I, I nearly didn't put this one in because it uh, was never one that I was, I thought was going to do very well. It was almost an afterthought. I needed an extra image to put into the creative section. And I thought, mm. oh, I've got this one that I made because when I was doing competitions, I was churning them out quite a lot. And I'm thinking, right, what else can I do? Um, but basically I've got the, the shot of the girl that was the, um, the inspiration for the image. And I, I really loved the attitude of her. And she was taking a, a, a recreation at a place called Canuck Chase. Um, and there were just people dressed up sat outside um, tents. And I think they were like almost got a medieval feel to the, the recreation that they were doing. Uh, I think this girl was just wandering about around a little bit bored almost. Um, mm. And so she looked at me um, with this expression and I, I just took the photograph and I just stored it and I've tried it in so many different places. I've tried her in forests and um, in a, a scene that I took in Italy, lots of different places and it's just never seemed to work. Uh, and this, the the main background here is probably, I'm just looking around it, I think it is pretty much all the same location. It's a place in Wales um, on the on, on the coast, just slightly down from Barmouth. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's mainly the background, but then it's had a moody sky added to it. The castle on the hill has been added. Um, and I'd, li I'd like to say that that was Scarborough Castle. Mm. I can't be sure. But anything that I use in any of my compositions, I have taken myself. I never use stock images. They're mm. all things that I've taken myself. Because <clears throat> um, that was one of the rules that we, we had um um, for entering competitions that the images had to be things that you'd taken. Um, and there's probably about 10 hours work in this image um, because the girl herself, as well as cutting it out, has had some work done to make it feel a little bit more windswept. Her dress has been extended so i basically copied some of it stretched it out to make it look like the wind's blowing it um it's not out of that kind of angle in the original photograph and then the hair as well is blowing in the wind and that wasn't blowing in the wind so what i've done is i've painted individual strands of hair um i've got a tablet and a stylus so i just spent probably two hours just literally drawing individual strands of hair over the over the top of the original just to make it feel like um the wind was blowing the the wind was blowing a hair so it's a case of trying to just pick up different colors from her the the hair so it feels real of, of her existing hair um, and then a little bit of blur just to make it feel real as well. Um, I've added mist to the background. Um, and then there's a red kite that I took in um, in Wales, just in the sky as well. Um, then bits of colour toning just to almost desaturate it. There's not a lot of colour in there just to make it all hang together. And one of the biggest things that... Um, people don't get right when they do this is adding shadows underneath the character yeah. to make them feel like they actually um, 
are stuck to the ground. The mm -hmm. amount of times you see people try these kind of composites where they haven't attached the character to the ground properly. And it's all about just creating a believable shadow. And what was the um, story behind his face? What what was the influence of his... Well, I, 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 in my head, I imagined that she was a servant girl that worked at the castle and she was on her way home. Uh, it's... um. So she was trudging over the moors after spending a day working in the castle, going back to her um, little cottage somewhere on this bleak moorland. But with um, with these kind of things, um, it's all about the viewer making up their, their own interpretation, really. When I'm judging images... Um, because I do do some camera club judging, um, I will say um, that I'm not interested in the title. I've ha we've had judges before say that they think titles are absolutely vital to let the the viewer or the judge know the intention of the image. But for me, I think the image should tell the intention of the image. And so my... Um, idea of what what it was about really um, is irrelevant because it's, it's about what the viewer thinks. It's a bit like good poetry. A lot of poetry is interpreted by the reader um, and you can read your own thing into it. And I think that's the, the joy of this kind of thing. Mm. But that, that, that was my, that was my idea. Yeah, because I used to do compositions when I first, started doing photography because I used to follow a lot of digital artists and mm -hmm. um, that's how I got into photography by following digital artists and um, I took tales in Scotland ghost stories like the Mackenzie Mackenzie's mm -hmm. uh, crib and create pictures based on actual storylines or myths that happen around Edinburgh and then, like yourself, I would take pictures of the location mm. and create the character that's associated with it to do that. And the whole point was to actually make it more... Well, one of my accreditations that I've got is um, from the PAGB. Yeah. One of my accreditations that I've got is from the PAGB. Um, they do a um, an accreditation scheme. And I've got the DAPGB. DP, DPAGB, which is a distinction level. Um, and to get that, you need to put 15 images into a panel that's judged by um, six judges and you need to score 300 points. And each judge can score a maximum of five. So, it, so you can get um, technically 30 points per image. Um, but it's still pretty tough going, but my entire panel was made up of similar images to this. Um, the, so they were pretty much all composites because at the time that's what I did. And the, my composites were my most successful images in competitions. Did you ever think that, because like recently I went to um, see an exhibition by a lady called Jenny Matthews and she worked on a lot of human humanitarian projects for human rights across the world document but what was fascinating about her was it wasn't just the fact she took images of current affairs that had happened in that country or human right issues but she had taken these photos and then printed them on material and then she stitched or sewed um additions onto the actual image so like example um, she did a, a collection of pictures of um, the Taliban and Afghan, Afghanistan women mm -hmm. who were affected by the Taliban. And she had stitched over their faces to cover their faces. And um, and it was just interesting because she used a lot of very bright colours, like bright blues, bright yellows, you know, yeah. the background with the images of the pictures. And um, well, I was wondering, because of these compositions, people tend to do them as prints would you ever because you said you fascinated with art and you came from an art background 
would you ever take one of these images and do something, you know, like paint on it or do something a bit of extra with it? You know, I've, I've it never that? considered doing anything like that. Obviously, I, I used to print a lot of images when I was entering competitions. I printed an awful lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I, when I was at university, I lived with um, a very talented artist um, who did a lot of that mixed media kind of um, artwork. And so I've seen a lot of it, but I've just never considered doing any myself. It was, um, mm. um, that, that, um, that, that particular guy is now earning a living from, it's um, like a graffiti artist almost. And he goes all over the world doing um doing his artwork um he gets commission from councils and he's been to america and all over the place and he's a very talented guy it's amazing mm. no it's a, it's a i mean how long ago would it be you created this daryl how long ago or how long did it take or how long ago oh how long ago um this oh it would be a it was certainly before I got the YouTube channel, and that started in 2019. So I'm, I would say it could be nearly 10 years. Uh, it's, it's that kind of time. Maybe a little bit less than that, to be fair. It'd probably be between five and 10 years ago. I, I don't know whether I can be any more precise than that, really. But certainly before the YouTube channel in 2019, because I haven't really done any of this kind of work since then. Um but at the time I was doing it, I was I was literally going out to these recreation events just to build up a stock of characters and then looking at the characters, coming up with the ideas and blending them together. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it, I've spent 10 hours on an image and then got to the end of it and thought, I don't like that and ended up scrapping it. Well, this one, I can see how it's done well. It's really, I think it's, you know, it's got a lot of, just a lot of atmosphere and, you know, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, you know, I can see that, but um, yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. But yeah. yeah. Okay, is there anything else got any other questions? The thing is, I think the thing is with this is, the thing is with this is it's one of those kind of images and it's a style that sometimes photographers rile against because it's not real photography. Um, and when I first joined the camera club and I started entering images like this, there was an awful lot of um, backlash mm -hmm. from the old guard. And because it was not out of camera. Um, mm -hmm. And some people don't consider this photography now, for me, again, it's about creating an image. And I still, do, even though I don't do this kind of photography anymore, I, I tend, most of my photography now is much more realistic and out of camera. I still will defend this as a, a legitimate art form because everything in this image has it's come real. out of my camera. Yeah. And yeah. it's taken a certain level of skill to put it together in a way that um, has created this image. Uh, it's just a different genre. I'm sure at one point um, when people started taking photographs, the people who painted for a living denigrated people who use cameras and the same happened when digital came along. The, um, the film specialist would have disliked the digital and it's just a different art form and it's just a way of using tools that are available to create yeah. an image and i'm not trying to pretend it's something that it's not exactly um, that's key that's the key thing Daryl. what you've said there you know and it's and i think it's all down to our own interpretation how we want to be creators and you know what we want to do and it's um personally you know, I, really, personally i find it's more like digital art because obviously mm. a lot of the people that I used to follow in Instagram initially were all digital artists. And like you said, they took photos of particular images that they'd done and then composed it together. 
but they've they've taken it even further now. There's a gentleman I follow who's an ambassador for Pixarts, one of the apps, and he's actually animates his images now. So it's not just composing it, it's actually making it more real life, you know? And I think uh, for me, um, you know, artistic imp uh, expression is is your own. So really when you create, for me, is that when we create art, like this image is obviously, um, is an art and, and it is very subjective and it's our way of, um, expressing, you know, our own unique take into 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 creating, you know, um, images that that we we like and and communicates with us. And and I think I I, I know what you're saying that you know people tend to to uh, criticize those who actually create you know composite images, but it is an art form and and it shouldn't be you know look at as something not real because at the end of the day it's some it's someone has put it together put the work in it uh to come up with the image and and that should be respected and that's my take on it yeah absolutely no, i totally agree Okay, well, this has been absolutely wonderful, Daryl. Thanks for that. So, for people watching, where's the best place that they can, you know, find you? Um, you know, on your social medias, or we spoke about your YouTube. Well, there's, you just... yeah, there's lots of places people can find me, but probably the main place that uh, people can find me is on YouTube. And so, if you were to search for Daryl Oakton Photography, then that's my YouTube channel. But I also have a website which is DarylOakton.com. And I'm on Instagram and Vero. Uh, and I'm on um, Instagram and Vero. Um, I was just getting that right then. Um, and that is at the Oakden Photography. Okay, we'll put all the links in all your socials and and, and your YouTube but, uh, in the in the credits below. But well, thank you for this tonight, Daryl. It's been wonderful, and thanks for sharing those images and all the stories behind them. So that's a big thank you from me and. Um, and I hope everyone's enjoyed this and Gladys and uh, Jan, do you want to say anything? Yes, thank you so much for, you know, for coming to talk to us tonight. It's been a delight. And um, as we both live locally, <laughs> to Shropshire and Staffordshire and Cheshire is quite near each other. We might actually um, bump into each other. Uh, anywhere yeah. near Pudley Gorge or Corbar Edge or you know in those areas so looking forward to to seeing you in the future and certainly I will check out the um the YouTube channel much more and well, thank, thank you. you very much and thank you for coming I really appreciate it as well and it's yeah, been and so thank lovely. you for asking it's our it's pleasure been lovely seeing a variety of different photography as well in your work it's been mm -hmm. it's been very interesting yeah. yeah. Now, and it's been a pleasure talking to you all. I have really enjoyed it. Um, and hopefully um, I've inspired some people to get out and enjoy their photography. Thank you, Daryl. So okay. 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 Bye, everyone. Uh, Thank goodbye. You. Okay. Bye. 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 <clears throat> yep. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Lens Lounge. And this evening we've got. Um... Um,